All right, I think we are ready to start for our closing plenary session. And I really want to thank everyone for being here all day on a, not only on a Friday, but a Friday where everyone's talking about the weather. So uh, <laughs> thanks for sticking it out with us. Um, our final conversation is, is really going to be an interview uh, style. And Nadine Strassen probably doesn't need introduction to people in this room, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. And she's got some really exciting projects that we're going to talk about. And then also take a look back at some of the themes that came up today and just have a chance to dig a little bit further into them. Uh, so Nadine is a New York Law School professor emerita. Did I get that right? Um, and she's the past national president of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 2008, senior fellow at FIRE, a leading expert and frequent speaker, media commentator on constitutional law and civil liberties. She's testified before Congress many, many times. She's on the advisory boards of many different organizations, including ACLU, Heterodox Academy, American Freedom Alliance, National Coalition Against Censorship. Um, and who doesn't want Nadine to be involved in their project? I think her most important affiliation is that she's on our Speakers Bureau at Voices for Liberty <laughs> and is actually available to visit campuses through our initiative as well. Um, you know, the National Law Journal has named uh, Nadine one of the America's 100 most influential lawyers. And she's the author of a book called Hate, which I recommend everybody read. Uh, the subtitle is Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. Very relevant to our theme today. And there's an upcoming book that Nadine has. Next month will be published. And the title is What Everyone Needs to Know. Um, free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know. And there's a flyer for that outside on the table in case you're interested in learning more about the book. And she is also the host and project consultant for Free to Speak a new three-hour documentary film series scheduled for release on public television in October as well. So Nadine has a lot going on, and I get tired just listening to her travel schedule. Thank you for making the pit stop here in Arlington, Virginia, for us, um, and welcome. Oh, Debbie, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for this wonderful conference. I actually read all of the papers. Some of the authors were surprised to hear that. And I wrote Debbie and others about it last week because I was so impressed by how terrific the papers are. I frankly thought that everything that could be said about this really important subject, uh, the interconnection between human rights and social justice and so forth uh, and free speech had already been said. And I was really enlightened and inspired by the new perspectives and information and the discussions today have been great. So. Thank and, you. and I've asked, I think, all of the authors except one for permission to quote your papers, which I would like to do. So if you haven't yet given me permission, please do so. Uh, Nadine, that's wonderful. And uh, yes, you're, you're inspiring all of us to just continue with this project and make sure more new scholarship is being done. So we will definitely continue that. So uh, last night at dinner, you mentioned that it was very special for you to be visiting this particular school of law and that you have a relationship with Justice Scalia that made this a trip special for you. Yes. Uh, uh, it's not the first time I've had the privilege of being on this campus. In fact, it's the first time I haven't gone to visit the statue of Nino, as uh, he long ago asked me to call him. I like to say that we were friends, not despite our very strong disagreements on important issues of constitutional law, including some free speech issues. Uh, but because of it, I had the privilege of debating him all over the world. And through that experience, uh, we became very friendly. And uh, when I stepped down as ACLU president, he was one of three Supreme Court justices who very um, graciously came to my retirement uh, ceremony. Wonderful. Well, we're glad to have you here. Uh, so, new book and a new movie project, both in October. Tell us a little bit more about each, the book and the movie. Uh, the book is part of an Oxford University Press trade named series, the What Everyone Needs to Know series, aimed at a generally well-educated audience in question and answer format. And even though this series had existed for about 15 years or more, amazingly, there was not a, a, a book in the series about free speech. So I, that was a great opportunity for me to write uh, a book that 
basically drew on my experiences for the past um, seven or so years during which I've been speaking about 200 times per year uh, about free speech to various audiences on campus and elsewhere all across this country and in many other countries because the issues are um, converging. And uh, basically, I answer questions, both from interviewers and from audiences, so I knew what people's most pressing questions about free, and most common questions about free speech are, and I basically sat down at my laptop. Quite, and and the, my reason for wanting to write the book is this, Debbie. I've always separated my role as an educator from my role as an advocate. As an educator, my student, my mantra for my students is that they must be able to understand, articulate, and advocate all plausible perspectives on all issues. Obviously, as an advocate, I advocate certain perspectives on free speech issues, but I saw a convergence in this sense that the more people understand about what free speech principles actually are, the more they understand the history that gave rise to them and the bad experiences under censorship, both in our country and around the world, the more supportive they become. And I've actually seen survey data that supports that. So after having made that observation to my husband, I said, you know, I really want to write free speech for dummies. <laughs> and um, somebody persuaded me that this Oxford series is even more appropriate, although maybe the dummies will be my next project. I guessing it's going to be. <laughs> so the film, what was the motivation for making the film? And then there are, there have been some films about free speech and I'm wondering what makes this one different. So why this film and why with you? I was uh, the second choice uh, and I'm very proud because the the first choice, this was a project that had started a number of years ago by the uh, Free to Choose Network, for which I had been interviewed for prior documentary series hosted by Doug Ginsburg, um, DC Circuit Judge, former Harvard Law Professor, about the Constitution and about the Declaration of Independence. So I was very familiar with the work product of this production company and their very pro-individual liberty and civil rights values. Um, but they had started this series about free speech before I became involved. It was quite far along. And the person who was the uh, intended narrator was P.J. O'Rourke, wonderful humorist and great free speech advocate. And sadly and tragically, he died at, at a young age. And I was very honored to follow in his footsteps, especially when I found that uh, he was one of the people who very strongly endorsed me for that, that position. Uh, as to what's special about this film series, it, um, it, there are three parts. One deals with government and society, another one deals with art and science, and the third one deals with academia and the arts. And I have to say, you know, the old saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. I would say a motion picture is worth many, 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 many thousands of words. Uh, the filmmakers traveled all over the world and pieced together literally dozens of episodes of censorship uh, that involve people with every possible identity, every possible ideology, every possible subject to really underscore uh, the universality of the desire for free speech on the part of many of us and the counter forces that come from government and society uh, for many others. And it also goes into historic examples. So it, it really it shows that there has been an enduring human aspiration for free speech. And while I see it as uh, very much celebrating free speech, it is done in a frighteningly fair way. Uh, for example, the segment on hate speech uh, features Jeff Stone, University of Chicago law professor, was the editor for my hate speech book. Uh, and John Rauch is one of the prominent commentators, Emerson Sykes, uh, others from ACLU background, including Eleanor Holmes Norton. 
Um, on the other hand, who will argue in favor of freedom, even for hate speech, especially if we want freedom for anti-hate speech, but they also have very powerful advocates from Germany who make a very powerful case that if we want to avert the rise of Nazism, given certain historical circumstances in Germany, but they claim around the world, um, we should be in favor of censoring hate speech. So I think that it is fair in giving um, competing perspectives and therefore a wonderful vehicle for stimulating information, but also discussion true to the free speech ideal, including among students at all levels of education. So trying to capture free speech about free speech. This is going to be wonderful. Well, would you all like to see the trailer? Because we do have the trailer. Yes. Okay, let's see the trailer. Where's the popcorn? <laughs> when we grew up, we rarely heard what we would today call hate speech. Today, a kid growing up and goes on social media is going to hear it all the time. If you repeat it again and again, certain ideas, we are going to adopt it. And not only children or young people, but also you and me. This is something that we should not allow. Okay, who gets to decide? What's the punishment? And what does it mean to be mean? Whether you are racist or not, whether you agree with me or not, as long as it's only words, that's guaranteed by the First Amendment. We have this growing incentives to self-censor because of plain fear. If I see him, who did the cartoon about Muhammad? If I see him, I kill him. They were not asking for my respect. They were asking for my submission. The impulse to censor has been there since the beginning of time. If I changed the ending and made it more remorseful, and I remember that word, if I made the ending more remorseful, then he would give it a rating. Homosexuality is not in line with our culture. It's not good for us. After I said I would not be changing the ending, the film was banned. What is appropriate? The real question is, who decides what is appropriate? We've learned from our own mistakes that allowing censorship only allows more censorship. Once you gave the government the power to decide that their speech could be banned, you also gave the government the power to decide that your speech could be banned. Either everybody has all these rights or nobody does. If we can reduce the number of words available for minds to formulate things, it's much easier then to institute the orthodoxies that lie at the heart of our totalitarian program. That's why there's no revolution, because nobody knows they're, they're oppressed. What is a democracy? Like, what is human rights? Those are like very basic things that even children know in the West. North Koreans as authority, they've never heard such a thing. It's the cornerstone of everything. Ideas and thoughts and points of view. There were about 300 books that were pulled off the shelves within the first month of school. They think that they can somehow solve the world by limiting what knowledge people have. It was always an issue of control. Always has been and still is. Coming soon <laughs> in October. I should add for anybody who's a teacher or has a community group um, that on the website for the Free to Choose Network, there are just incredible resources. The films are broken down into many topic clips of very short lengths and uh, resources in terms of questions for discussion and extra readings. Can't wait to see the whole thing. <laughs> so, so Turning to some of the themes now and tying what we saw in the film to what we discussed all day here, as you know, the Voices for Liberty initiative is focused on free speech, civil rights, and social progress. And we talked about those, those three concepts throughout the day. How do you see the relationship between those three concepts? And how do you talk about the relationship? I, I feel as if I'm going to be redundant in this audience. So just to say, for all of the reasons that have been so powerfully expressed by the papers and the speakers today, including my 
longtime colleague Jonathan Rauch. Uh, if you look at the history of social justice movements in the United States and around the world, they have depended most vitally on free speech and been subject to censorship. I think one of the, uh, and have been thwarted mostly by, by censorship, uh, one of the details that I learned by doing research for my latest book is reading some of the many Supreme Court cases about free speech that came from the civil rights movement. I think a lot of people don't realize that case after case that we think of as a landmark free speech decision arose specifically in the context of the civil rights movement from the Warren Court, which was sympathetic to both causes. And what is so interesting is to read the lower court decisions, including state Supreme Court decisions that the Supreme Court overturns, the rationales that are used to suppress peaceful pro-civil rights advocacy are exactly the same rationales that we hear on campus today to suppress anti uh, civil rights advocacy or racist or other discriminatory speech, um, including that it causes trauma, that it causes emotional harm. Uh, of course, that it might incite to violence or uh, to even be um, uh, subversive. So, for example, I think I can, I can paraphrase it fairly closely. There were two cases, one from South Carolina and one from Louisiana, both involving students, so it makes it, again, the comparison to today's campus situation even more pointed and poignant. Uh, students are being led by ministers in both cases in um, just peaceful, you can't even call them protests, they're, they're singing patriotic songs and they're singing, we shall overcome. Uh, sometimes they're holding banners that, you know, I am a human being. Very insubordinate speech, right? Um, and you get testimony from local law enforcement officials, which persuades not only the lower court judges, but state Supreme Court justices to say it is inherently insulting and emotionally disturbing and inciting to violence to see black and what, no, they use the word Negro, to see Negro and white people together singing such provocative lyrics as black and white together. So, you know, I, I think if students today understood a little bit more of that history and, and overcame the, uh, the, the current framework to understand that the points that they're making, the rationales that they're advocating, can be used not, not only to promote ideas they believe in, in terms of social progress and racial justice, but to counteract those ideas. Um, that goes a long way toward support, uh, increasing support for free speech. I wanna go back to something that you just referenced in your last, uh, your last answer here. We saw images in the trailer of what some people would label anti-civil rights movements. Um, can anti-civil rights movements hurt civil rights movements through speech? Of course. Uh, I think the Supreme Court said it best in Snyder versus Phelps, the case in which they upheld freedom of speech for the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, which basically said, God, I'm so, sorry, uh, uh, I guess I should give a trigger warning that uh, the, the, the motto of this organization is God hates fags, uh, but it also espoused hatred against every other possible minority group, including Catholics and Jews and um, basically anybody who wasn't a member of their church. And what I thought was very helpful about the Supreme Court ruling was that uh, the court strongly acknowledged the harmful impact of the speech 
you know, despite the fact that you know, many people say, oh, the Supreme Court justices and the ACLU and the rest of you who strongly support free speech, you deny that it causes any harm. That could not be further from the truth. The court went on to say, we defend freedom of speech precisely because it is so powerful. And that is a power to do great harm as well as great good. And if this, I will paraphrase uh, many Supreme Court decisions here, that although speech that is constitutional, the speech that is, first of all, the speech that is the most harmful, you know, as under the Brandenburg test, for example, that directly and imminently incites uh, violence and, and, and or unlawful conduct that's likely to happen imminently, other speech that satisfies the so-called emergency principle, um, even speech that is constitutionally protected because it doesn't satisfy those appropriately difficult standards can definitely cause harm. But that is not enough to justify restricting it. We have to say, but what about the harm of empowering government with this greater latitude and discretion to punish speech? And it was before Brandenburg uh, and before the speech protective decisions that started in the 1960s that the Supreme Court um, allowed government to suppress every advocate of every social justice movement. So dangerous as free speech is, the alternative, I believe, history has shown to be in the long run and often in the short run much more dangerous. Let's talk some more about that because the logic, you can see how we go from one step to the next step. If free speech can result in harm, if speech can hurt, then don't we need to protect people from harm and hurt? So we pass the laws, the hate speech laws. And in different countries, I grew up in Canada, we have a hate speech law that, that has been around for a long time and other countries have them too. How come that's not the solution? How, how come we can't protect people from hate speech through laws? Well, first of all, I completely support, I, I hope this goes without saying, but I'll earn, in the free speech spirit, I'll earn in favor of saying too much rather than too little. I absolutely oppose hatred and discrimination and stereotyping. And in fact, the, the title of my book is Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. My goal is to resist hatred. And I am convinced, based on my study of history, my study of what's happening in Canada, the United States, uh, and around the world, my uh, reading of the testimonies of human rights activists from around the world, uh, many of whom I quote throughout my book, is that no matter how well intended these laws might be, they are best ineffective and at worst counterproductive. And that's why so many human rights champions, including in Germany, um, oppose restrictions on hate speech. What we're trying to suppress are certain hateful and discriminatory attitudes and certainly discriminatory and hateful actions. And you don't make the idea go away by suppressing the expression of it. Uh, you certainly don't outlaw discriminatory conduct by targeting words. And unfortunately, in many countries, including Germany, there's been uh, an inverse correlation between the punishment of speech and the punishment of discriminatory conduct. And I think that this is something that I wasn't aware of until fairly recently, so let me just, just uh, uh, summarize that. Germany has had very strict anti-hate speech laws throughout modern history, including during the Weimar Republic when the Nazis rose to power. Uh, it, uh, according to analysts, it has to this day the strictest anti-hate speech law of any country in the world, with the possible exception of a couple of countries in the Middle East. Um, and yet Germany continues to see disturbing episodes of not only anti-Semitic and anti-refugee and other discriminatory speech, but also violence, including anti-Semitic violence, to the extent that when she was chancellor, I believe in 2020, 
uh, Angela Merkel, for the very first time in German history, uh, felt it necessary to appoint a cabinet-level minister for anti-Semitism. And both that person and the leading, the leader of the central Jewish organization in Germany um, issued declarations to Jewish men saying that it was not safe for them to go out in public, including in Berlin, like the crossroads of, of Europe, uh, wearing the yarmulke because so many people have been targeted for um, for attacks. Now, I, I, I want to. I'm going to ask a question to the uh, the wonderful astute audience members here to be answered um, uh, after you and I are through with the interview. Uh, a few years ago, I debated uh, somebody from the uh, an EU commissioner, Vera Yarova, whom I think of as the the censorship czar there, but she's the one that's been insisting on social media um, censorship of hate speech, and I cited all of these. Uh, statistics and evidence about the rise of hatred, not only in, in, in actual hateful violence um, in Germany, but other European countries. And for me, the conclusion is, therefore, the anti-hate speech laws don't work. For her, the conclusion was, therefore, we need more anti-hate speech laws. So I, I've asked many social scientists, can we you know, get a definitive answer to that, or, or is it just uh, that some people are going to have one perspective, the pro-liberty perspective, and others will have a different one. Um, but the point that I wanted to make about Germany is that not only during the Weimar Republic did they fail to punish actual violence, including the actual coup uh, that was instigated by Hitler in, in Munich. I mean, he, got, he served eight months in prison for what would have been a capital offense and certainly should have at least prohibited him from running for office again. Uh, but Germany, until shockingly recently, did not even outlaw discrimination on the basis of race, religion, and so forth in employment, housing, public accommodations. Now, the United States, and you know, I've been a full-time constructive critic of my government for not sufficiently protecting human rights, uh, but we were uh, on the forefront of enacting anti-discrimination laws, certainly at the state level. I think that started in the 1940s. Uh, and Germany did not enact its first anti-discrimination law until well into this century. And it only did so because the European Union demanded it uh, and imposed a deadline for doing it. Germany ignored that deadline and finally, finally took that step. It's like the opposite, right? <laughs> the opposite approach. Uh, so I am wondering, one of the, the topics that came up earlier today is about social media. And uh, we talked a little bit about Section 230 and whether that's a civil rights statute. I'm curious, given your global perspective on this, how, how, what do you think the effect of social media has been on free speech and on civil rights? One of the things that I loved about the, the paper and, um, and the comments were great as well is that it underscored what too many people take for granted now which is the positive pro-human rights impact that social media have had. I think, you know, so much focus tends to be disproportionately on the negative, including that old saw, when it bleeds, it leads. And I'm old enough to remember when the internet first burst upon the public and political radar screen and civil libertarians and human rights activists were understandably enthusiastic about it. Uh, and the Supreme Court was too, talking about how this could empower people who previously had not really had a voice. Uh, in the 1940s, uh, A.J. Liebling famously said that freedom, dismissively, that freedom of the press belongs to he who owns a printing press, namely most people don't have it. And yet now, most people have that ability. And I also have the historic perspective, given my longevity, uh, thank goodness, to, um, to understand that, uh, that groups and movements that have long existed 
did not really gain traction until they had access to social media. So for example, the ACLU began its campaign against uh, unjustified police violence, including killings, uh, predominantly against young black men in the 1980s, I believe. Uh, Michelle Alexander, who many of you know of now because of her uh, wonderful book about the new Jim Crow, when she was a just new, brand new graduate of Stanford Law School, uh, was working for the ACLU of Northern California and actually coined the term driving while black, we didn't get much traction about those issues until the Rodney King beating, which I believe was in 1991. And why did we get, we got some traction there because it was famously captured on videotape. And again, the picture being worth a thousand words, there was a lot of disappointment that the movement didn't go that far. Black Lives Matter actually was organized before it became a cause on, on social media, and, but really became galvanized, not only as a result of the ongoing um, tragic killings, that had been a continuum, but the ability to record it and deploy it, just as was so well described in, um, in, the, in the last panel. But I think what I can add is that knowing that these causes had existed before, which by the way, the same was true, I don't think John went quite as far back in history. We actually had a gay rights movement that went back even to the 19th century. Uh, and of course, women's rights and reproductive freedom and all of those movements didn't really gain traction until the Supreme Court protected free speech. I wanna pick up on something you said, Nadine, and which is we do tend to focus on the bad instead of the good and on, on the what feels like going backwards rather than the progress. So I think you said you've been to 200 campuses in the last year. <laughs> that made my eyebrows go up. Not campuses, but very okay. many campuses. Okay. You've been speaking to a lot of students. And we do hear about the bad news around free speech and, and how students think about those issues. What gives you hope when you go to campus and you're talking to students about your work? Well, thank you so much. I mean, first of all, the fact that I am invited to a lot of campuses, very often by student groups. I mean, it's a mixed bag. Um, some of the students that have formed free speech alliances and uh, bridge organizations are feel very embattled. Uh, but on the other hand, they have been exercising their free speech rights and their free association rights to push back against censorship, to try to create uh, campus culture that is conducive to free speech and civil discourse. And um, they show amazing courage. I, I have to say, you know, one of the examples is sitting right here in the audience. I don't want to make him blush, but I won't look at him. Alec uh, was a student leader for free speech in his undergraduate campus. And I, I asked him um, he, what, what he could prescribe for other students. But, you know, let me mention um, just one example who got quite a bit of national publicity. Um, and I'm so sorry I'm blanking out on his, I, I think it was Trent Colbert at Yale Law School. Please correct me if somebody knows if, if that's the correct name or not. A couple of years ago, he, and he's a Native American, Cherokee, I believe, uh, conservative. He was a leader of the Na Native American Law Students Association and also of the Federal Society. And he sent out an email to the list of all of his law school classmates um, using a phrase, trap house, which I learned is colloquial slang among young people for a drinking party, uh, but apparently it had some raci arguably racial uh, origins, so that led to his being hauled in before a couple administrators at Yale, who pretty much, and he captured this, again, the power of not only the, uh, the phone, but the camera, uh, but also social media to distribute it widely. He captured the administrators, th basically threatening to withhold the necessary character and fitness recommendation that you need to be able to practice law. And he resisted their pressure 
and stood up against you know, the top echelon of the law school even before he had his law degree, facing a, I think, credible threat that he would be hampered in his ability to practice law. And I was just in awe. So I, I asked him, because I'm always speaking on campuses and people are always asking me, what can we do to improve the free speech climate? And there's only so much that we oldsters can do, since the problem is basically a lot of peer pressure. We have to help the peers to uh, encourage each other. And so I asked him for his advice, and uh, I'll share it, because I know we've got a lot of campus uh, leaders and professors and students here. Uh, he gave me two pieces of advice. One was, he said, you need, in order to speak up, you need to have a couple people that you trust completely, and that who completely trust you. He said, it doesn't have to be a large group, but you definitely need that core of support. And I thought, you know, that does correspond to psychological um, studies that, I, that I've read. Uh, the other thing he said to us older folks is, you have to do a better job of marketing because FIRE and Heterodox Academy and other organizations had offered their support, but he was completely unaware that they existed. And he thought that if more students were aware of that kind of resource and support that more of them, so that's where we do come in uh, to encourage them to speak up and improve their, their peer culture. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, yes, so this is why we are trying to send speakers to campus to help bring these questions to the minds of the students and, and, and encourage them to question what they, what they think they know about free speech, the history, et cetera. So, I'm, I'm glad that they're asking for that, right? Um, so let's turn to questions from the audience. I have one last question for Nadine. I'm gonna save it for the very end, but questions from all of you. Uh, thank you so much. I, I know at this panel we've talked a lot about like how free speech can push forward social progress. Um, and one of the things that we've um, talked about too is the you know, need to focus on you know, rooting out discrimination. And a lot of organizations have focused on anti-discrimination law as a way to do that. And there are some tensions between anti-discrimination law and free speech. And the ACLU has also been involved on these cases, siding with uh, Colorado's side on the 303 Creative v. Ellis uh, decision. And so I was wondering if you'd be able to speak a little bit on how you think we should navigate this balance when there are tensions between anti-discrimination laws and free speech, and if you think there is this necessary trade-off that has to be there. You know, in every, there are often potential conflicts, I'll put it that way, or tensions between free speech and other constitutional values and rights, um, including not only equality rights, but also uh, due process rights, privacy rights, uh, free exercise of religion, non-establishment of religion. And in all cases, I believe that human rights advocates and should do what the Supreme Court and other judges try to do, which is to maximally accommodate the competing rights uh, in light of all the facts and circumstances. This is a theme that's come up. I know Emerson touched on it, among others. Um, free speech law is necessarily quite fact specific. Um, so since you mentioned one specific case, Alec, uh, let me discuss that. I respectfully dissented from the position that was taken by my ACLU colleagues in that case, and I've discussed it with David Cole, the legal director, whom I, I greatly respect. Uh, and there's a great ACLU tradition at stake. Let me mention the case that we're talking about um, is often referred to as the web designer case. And um, it involved a Colorado law that um, compelled the, well, so it was a web designer who argued that she should not be compelled to create websites uh, that conveyed messages that were antithetical to her beliefs. Interestingly enough, 
her beliefs included not only that marriage should be only between a man and a woman, but her beliefs also included that all people are equal in dignity and human rights regardless of matters such as sexual orientation or gender identity. So if you had asked her to create a website that was anti-gay, for example, uh, or anti-trans, she also would have refused to create that. It was very clear that she was discriminating or selecting, to use a less loaded term, on the basis of message, not on the basis of, of ideology. And while you know there were very many, in these cases, because there are competing concerns, uh, the facts are very important, and in other cases, such as the prior cake case, I did uh, strongly agree with the ACLU's position in that case because I didn't think that the facts showed that simply baking a cake is sufficiently expressive. In this case, I'm not sure how many people realize it, Colorado agreed to an extraordinary detailed set of stipulated facts including that the website was not only expression, but it was artistic expression that she created and that was and would be perceived as her expression, not that she was serving as a mere conduit. Uh, and the way the Supreme Court phrased the question, uh, it was, can government compel uh, somebody to create artistic expression that violates her sincere beliefs. And I was invited to Yale Law School to ostensibly to debate the, the lawyer for uh, the website, and I found myself, as I was preparing for it, just agreeing with the position that I was supposed to debate against based on the stipulated facts. So I was uh, at Yale Law School, I was doing the debate before the Floyd Abrams Institute, which is named after the legendary First Amendment lawyer and good friend of mine, Floyd Abrams. So, you know, I must admit, I'm not like Trent Colbert. I don't want to stick my neck. I was afraid to stick my neck out without some comfort. Well, so Floyd was one of my friends that I went to. And I said, Floyd, what do you think about this case? And he wrote back an email that he gave me permission to quote. He said, especially given the stipulated facts and the question that the Supreme Court framed, how could we not wish the court to answer it in a way that differs from our usual allies, including ACLU? If I can say one other thing, please. Um, it's the importance of the freedom against compulsory speech, compelled speech, uh, which goes back to an ACLU case in 1943, West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. And controversial as the speech, you know, the choice not to create a website for gay marriage is today. Um, the, the decision or the choice not to salute the American flag when we were in World War II fighting fascism was at least as controversial and deeply hated. The Jehovah's Witnesses were um, persecuted all over the country, uh, subject to forced administration of castor oil to make them to somehow loosen their tongues. One was even castrated, and they were tarred and feathered. Um, and yet, the Supreme Court, in, in one of the most eloquent decisions in favor of free speech, um, said that even more deeply violative of individual liberty than being denied the right to say something you do want to say. It's even more violative to be compelled to say something you don't want to say. And if you read the opinion carefully, you'll see that twice. Uh, the court, to my mind, indicates that even strict scrutiny would not be enough to justify compelled speech, that there's literally, it's an absolute prohibition. Thank you. And Alex, uh, thank you for that question because I've been wondering what Nadine's answer would be to that one. Um, we have about a minute left, so I'm going to, there's one last question um, in the back. We'll keep it short. 
So the, the question may be short, the answer the may answer not be. The answer won't be, I apologize. <laughs> uh, so my name, my name is Nigel Ashford at the Institute of Humane Studies, and thank you so much for all the great work that you've done. And right uh, back at I, you. But I want to ask an awkward question. Well, I think it's an awkward question. Should there be any limit to the speech that should be available to children, especially in public schools and public libraries? Well, that's a one-minute answer. No, no, there shouldn't be. I mean, the limit should be the limits that are imposed um, as a matter of pedagogical concerns and educational suitability as determined by the responsible professionals the teachers and librarians in the school situation uh, and the parents in the home situation. But in ter that's in terms of curricula and library books. But in terms of the student's own expression, I think the Tinker Standard should apply uh, at the earliest age. Uh, they, they should be free to express themselves as long as they are not causing a material or substantial disruption to the educational process or violating the rights of others. Excellent. Uh, so while um, I call back to the stage David Bernstein, um, our executive director at the Liberty and Law Center, let me just ask you this, Nadine. So I, I think a lot of us are going to watch the film. Right. When we watch it, what is one thing you hope we take away from watching it? That every single one of us can make a difference uh, by exercising our freedom of speech or by not exercising it. So with respect to hate, for example, I take very seriously not only that we should oppose government censorship that goes beyond the emergency principle, but that we have, especially those of us who oppose censorship, have a special responsibility to engage in counter speech in the most robust sense of that term, which means to use every opportunity to proactively, affirmatively raise our voices in support of equality and human dignity and human rights for everyone. Thank you so much for making sure you were here today with us in person all day and for reading the papers, fully engaging with us. We're really, really appreciative. Right back at you and the audience. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nadine and Debbie. And I want to thank uh, all of the audience, both here and online, and everyone who contributed to uh, this event today. Of course, my colleague, Joanne, the folks at Steadfast, my colleague, Chris Newman, uh, who's our academic advisor for the project, uh, all of our speakers, of course, and our commentators. This was a very edifying day, and I think we all learned a lot. And uh, I would like now to uh, invite everyone to a post-event reception, which will be held in the lunch, the same place we had lunch and so forth across the hall. Uh, and uh, again, thank you all for your attention and for attending.